he found that it was the Phrygian name for bread. From seriously revolving this incident, the Egyptians were induced to allow the Phrygians to be of greater antiquity than themselves. So a piece of cultural relativism, this ancient king was willing to test a myth of his own culture. They believed they had the first language. He said, well, maybe it's not true. Let's do this experiment. And the experiment proved that his suspicions were correct. And I love this image of these kids coming up and saying, bread, bread. And no one knows what they mean until they could figure out that they're asking for bread. Now, Herodotus, like all great writers, knows that his audience is going to be skeptical. Yeah, it's a nice story, but did it really happen? So you notice that even when people are transcribing what we call myths, they have a sense of human inquiry and skepticism. So the next paragraph begins, this really happened. I myself heard it at Memphis from the priests of Vulcan. Again, he's using Greek terms to describe Egyptian religion, which is what makes uh, the reading of this text particularly fascinating. So these were some ancient ideas about the origins of language. Now, in the 19th century, archaeology and other scientific endeavors challenged these notions of language, just as they challenged the notions about the age of the earth and about the origins of humanity. For it's in the 19th century that we see the emergence of scientific geology and of the theory of evolution. So humans could no longer accept the mythic views of their origins, both of themselves and of the world. Well, this challenge to previously held beliefs had a kind of domino effect. So all sorts of beliefs were questioned. One famous example is the age of the earth. According to understandings of the biblical account, the biblical account doesn't deal in direct numbers or chronology, but according to understandings of it, the world for 19th century Westerners was about 6,000 years old. That's when creation was. This was a commonly held idea among Christians and among Jews. The Bishop of Ireland, Bishop Usher, in the 17th century, announced from the pulpit one Sunday that he had spent a long period of time calculating the exact age of creation. And he had figured out when the earth was created. October 22nd, 4004 BC. This was the date of creation. And if you look at many Bibles from the 19th and 20th century, you will see this chronology. I've come across it many times. You open it up in front of Genesis. In the beginning, it will say 4004 BC. I heard from a colleague in geology uh, in, a, in a university I, I taught in uh, as a guest lecturer a few years ago that throughout the world on October 22nd, many geologists celebrate this day as creation day because it's their work that undid this very long accepted chronology. Now, uh, what's the relationship between this and our subject, the origins of language? Well, once people questioned the origins of the age of the earth and the origins of the human race, they questioned the origins of language. No, it, it didn't make sense that language was given by a fish. Or it didn't make sense that language was invented by a king. There had to be an evolution of language, just as there was an evolution of species. And the science of archaeology backed this up. That is, language was found in different forms and in different stages of development. So people began to understand that culture evolves, as does nature. Now, this to us is one of the backbones of modern thought, but it was a revolutionary idea in the 19th century. Everything evolves, including writing systems. So let's look at those writing systems. By 3000 BC in Mesopotamia, in the area of Uruk, a city we've encountered before and I will speak of again, the city also known as Warka in the Bible Erech, E-R-E-C-H in translation, the city associated with Gilgamesh. There, in that area, they were producing documents, 
in cuneiform writing. And within a time span of a couple of centuries, in Egypt, using hieroglyphs, they were producing similar documents. And these documents were basically accounting documents, lists. Not very interesting for students of myth, but very important for students of history and for students of economics and trade. These lists, sometimes uh, we go beyond lists, there are contracts. Those are very common in the ancient Near East, business contracts. Historically preceded myth. This is what people did. Well, it's a commonplace. You have to make a living and then you can tell stories. Then you can have the leisure for someone to be appointed to tell stories. So a document which read four sheep, two jars of oil, seven small bundles of acacia wood was the kind of document that you would find in these ancient Near Eastern archives and it's the kind of document that the decipherers generally dealt with. A text that said, he is the companion of the gods, he sits among them and he listens to music, which is a line from the Epic of Gilgamesh. This is not the usual ancient Near Eastern text. This is something exceptional, something literary. In Sumer, and later throughout Mesopotamia, the cuneiform script developed and spread. Now this script is made up of characters which are wedge-shaped and they are written on clay with a stylus, which is actually where we get our idea of the pen from. They're incised on clay. Clay was a common material in Mesopotamia, as were reeds, which they used as the stylus. And each cuneiform symbol represented originally some kind of picture which later became abstracted into a sign. And this sign had a phonetic value. It had the value of a sound. And I will go into this in a bit more detail. Hieroglyphs, the word is Greek for holy signs, and it parallels the Egyptian for God's words, also used a system of representation that began with pictures, symbols, then these symbols became more abstract and they had a phonetic value. So each sign in these systems originally had the meaning of what was depicted, but later it became divorced from the meaning and it had the value of the sound. Let me illustrate from English because when one looks at these scripts, they're very intimidating, and it's really an amazing discovery that they bear so much similarity. Uh, in English, we have the word man, and we have the word date. So if I were to draw the figure of a man, and then to draw the figure of a date, that is, the date that you eat, and I put the figure of the man and the figure of the date together, you might scratch your head, but you could say, a wit would say oh, it means mandate, like the British mandate. Now the mandate has nothing to do with man or dates. It's the phonetic value of the symbol. Uh, a somewhat more whimsical example, if I were to put on the table a uh, salt shaker and uh, an AA battery, and I would ask you, to make a phrase out of it. A good one would be a salt and battery. Nothing to do with salt, nothing to do with batteries. Right? The symbol has phonetic value. This is the basic principle of ancient Near Eastern languages, but one which took an enormous amount of work to figure out. Now, the key to these languages was worked on by groups of scholars in the early 19th century the Englishman Thomas Young and the Frenchman Jean-Francois Champollion worked on Egyptian and they variously get credit for it and there are, there are great debates about who gets all the credit. A little earlier in uh, Germany, the great Orientalist Grotefend worked on deciphering Old Persian in cuneiform script and he figured out that system. These 
jobs were done in isolation. This was before the age of think tanks. That is, these people worked in their attics or in musty libraries on their own. There were scholarly communications, but mostly these decipherments were the products of heroic amounts of time and effort spent poring over inscriptions. The great majority of the myths, legends, and narratives that we will examine in this course were written in either the cuneiform languages or in Egyptian hieroglyphs. Now, these two systems in the ancient Near East were followed by the alphabet, but we don't get to the alphabet in history until approximately 1000 BC. The alphabet in which you have one sign with one phonetic value, and you have a small number of signs. In the early period, 30 or 32 signs. This was a great invention which made writing easy, and it freed scribes from this intense learning of language systems, which could take years. An alphabet can be learned very quickly. Now, I've been using the terms script and language somewhat loosely. Let me say more about them. We write the English language in the Latin script. The Latin script is itself derived from the Semitic alphabets, from the Aleph Bet of the Hebrews, R-A-B-C. Other languages in the modern world use the Latin alphabet, Swahili, for example, or Turkish. Today, they both use the Latin alphabet. The fact that they use the Latin alphabet doesn't tell us anything about the languages that they use. Swahili, Turkish, and English do not have a linguistic relationship. They're not in the same language groups, but they have decided to use the same script. So script and language are two different things. Of course, they're related but they're different. So when we speak of ancient Near Eastern scripts, we have to be careful to distinguish between script and language. They're not always the same. Let me be a little more specific. When we speak about Mesopotamia, the Mesopotamians used the cuneiform script, but because Mesopotamia was a culture which had a succession of societies and kingdoms, they had different languages. The Sumerians wrote their language in the cuneiform script. After the Sumerians, the Akkadians had a different type of language. They had a Semitic language, but they adopted the script of the Sumerians and some of the words, but that's not the issue here. They had a different language and they used the old script, much as Turkish, which a century ago was written in Arabic. Script is now written in Latin script. In Egypt, the situation is somewhat different. Egypt had a continuous civilization, unbroken by massive change. So the Egyptian language in its various forms was always represented by the Egyptian script. Now, the script changed. We have more cursive forms of the script, not immediately recognizable as hieroglyphs. But to a scholar, it's the same thing. In this lecture, we've examined the origins of writing systems, the cuneiform script in Mesopotamia and the hieroglyphic script in Egypt. We looked at myths about the origins of language and writing, and then moved to what science can tell us about that development, a development that enabled the emergence of civilization and the recording of myths. We have seen that the peoples of the ancient Near East, the Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, thought about this question. They inquired into the origins of language. They gave answers that we would consider mythic, but they gave answers that they were satisfied by. And in the case of the Egyptian pharaoh, described by Herodotus, they actually gave a scientific answer. Our next lecture will look at literary and religious aspects of myth.